is 3-2 Echo. We are in sector. Gunner up, scanning with thermals. Break. Have visual on enemy armor. In the I wake up suddenly. I don't know where I am. My body and bed are soaked. My heart is pounding and I feel like I just ran a marathon. It takes me about 10 seconds to remember that I'm in my room, in my trailer, in Carbondale, and safe. I stretch out with my senses, listening hard for sounds that don't belong. My eyes dart around the room for movement or a shadow out of place. My heart slows. It was just a dream. I roll over to the dry side of my bed, flip my blanket over, and drift off to sleep once again. War has costs. I want to go back to something you just said. The media doesn't care. I, I, I couldn't help but watching all day long a sort of Veterans Day honorary stories that I saw on a lot of the different cable networks today. Uh, you know, a lot of them honoring certain soldiers who risked their lives. Uh, a lot of them sort of glorifying the experience of war. Uh, your thoughts just sort of on media coverage of this. You've got Fox News saying that, you know, support the troops and uh, uh, it's we're at war on terror and, uh, you know, go, go, go. And then you got MSNBC that that's been semi-critical, but nobody has brought somebody on that's got a horrible dream to share, that's got a hor that talks about sleepless nights, that talks about alcohol addictions, and p pretty much people say, I support the troops. And meanwhile, the long-term costs of war have not been raised by the media at large. They say if you take these meds, you'll be able to sleep. They say if you talk to a therapist, you'll be able to cope. They say not to drink too much and don't abuse drugs. <laughs> they seem to tell you a lot of things, but they never seem to say there's a cure. In general, PTSD is characterized by three classes of symptoms. Re-experiencing the trauma, say through nightmares, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks. In the quiet moments of my day, my mind tends to wander. A friend of mine used to call it my space out. We'd be out doing something and I guess I would daze off into a daydream. When she shook me out of it, she'd ask where I was. And I'd always deflect the question by complimenting her beauty or something about the weather. I'd say just about anything to change the subject, even though I'm not sure who I was trying to protect. avoidance or numbing symptoms. People don't want to talk about it. They don't want the feelings associated with it. They don't want to go anywhere that reminds them of it. The way I escape is by telling only the funny stories. The stories of my marvelous drunken debauchery and all the foreign ports we visited. All the things you think being in the military is all about. you look down? I was like, hell no. Why? He said, look down. I looked down. Oh, shit, dude. Her dick was bigger than mine. In fact, I rarely share the bad times. And when I do, it's often in a group of other vets. When we talk amongst ourselves, there isn't a need to explain things. We already speak the same language, and that shared experience forms a bond that not many can understand. We are taught not to connect with the Iraqi people. We are taught not to, to view them as human beings. That's why 
It's common in the military to call Iraqi people Hajis, similar to, uh, uh, similar to Vietnam, where the Vietnamese Most people, people at some point or another, ask me, did you kill someone? From the, As if this is some badge of honor to be worn proudly. Human being, I couldn't, Perhaps I couldn't in this country it is. Look at the same kids. But I never answer the question, and when it's asked, I feel the weight of its suppression push hard against its containment. It almost feels as if I were to admit anything, I'd be justifying my past actions. Snap that off. Holy shit! It brought that motherfucker down. We gotta do shit. that shit again. Damn. It's not that these thoughts are always on my mind, but it sometimes feels like I have to consciously keep a wall up. It almost feels as if there's a part of me still on watch, still maintaining the vigilance against any internal threat or thought that may escape. But it's not just the memories. I'm afraid of the darkness and evil that also reside behind that wall. I know that I'm capable of causing pain and torment. I know that I can take a life as quickly as I can blink. And I know I fear this side of me. A few of my friends have seen it. I get so angry that my jaw clenches, my veins pop out of my arms and temples, and I've yelled with such force that I've made people shrink from me in fear, tears streaming down their face. Sometimes I get so angry, so many things just build up, I can't control these outbursts and I'm ashamed of myself when others see it. I think this is one of the reasons I haven't had a meaningful relationship for so long. I'm afraid of losing control. And symptoms of physical hyperarousal. These include difficulty sleeping, difficulty concentrating, exaggerated startle responses, and feeling very hypervigilant wanting to check things all around. When I walk, I walk with a purpose. But I find myself looking down and around, always aware, and never maintaining eye contact with anyone for more than a brief second. If I hear a noise or a loud bang, my head swivels towards its direction before I even know what it's doing. In classrooms, I find myself sitting facing the door, and I can't help but formulate a contingency plan in case something were to go wrong. I guess it's better to be prepared than not, and I'm sure some would find it strange. But to me, safe is a fickle concept. Until I adopted my dog Booker, I used to come home to an empty house. To tell you the truth, Booker has given me the ability to become attached to something again, an ability that has been numb for years. He's also helping me control my temper as he tests it daily. But at the end of my day, I don't go out. I go home where it's safe and secure, and I don't have to deal with the immediate world. As I heat up what I cooked the night before, medicating myself comes to mind. I don't like the pills the VA gave me, because they make me feel out of body, and I was a borderline alcoholic in the Navy, so I prefer an alternative method. Just two years ago. It is not a new idea to Mitt Romney, and it isn't, a new, it isn't new to the Republican Party either. Last year, the House of Representatives passed legislation to build on the successes of the 1996 welfare reform law. They did so because they want more Americans to know the pride and success that come from hard work. The law passed the House, but that act passed the House will require 40 hours of work each week to rush over ten to have unprecedented success. And after a few hours of decompressing, I'm finally ready for bed. In the beginning of this year, as I started to draw upon my military experiences in creating my art, a very interesting thing occurred. 
It appears as if a lot of my tension is expressed through me clenching my jaw as I sleep at night. So much so that for a week my jaw hurt so badly I couldn't eat large solid foods. I went to the dentist and was fitted with this mouth guard. And now I need to wear it every night when I go to bed. An unforeseen consequence of digging into the past, but at least it's one that can be alleviated. I'm tired and the thought of sleep is welcomed, but an overactive mind often keeps me up as I think through the many problems I've faced, both past and present. To remedy this, I listen to a book on tape, focusing my thoughts on the single narrator's voice, hopefully drifting off to a restful sleep. I don't care what you want to call it. I can't believe that it's not more relevant. I wish there was more public discourse about it. I don't blame the military or the government or even myself. But I know that I am still human. And these experiences will haunt me because of it. Seven, seven, nine, or eight. How come you?